So ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome at Passaporta. Um, this is my voice. It will hold, I hope, that this is what it sounds like. Uh, welcome to this public event of this year's biannual, the third biannual Passaporta seminar. My name is Matthijs de Ridder. I will guide you through the evening. So as you might know, uh, Passaporta organizes a biannual festival, and these festivals are organized in the art years, and that means that in the even years we do something else, and that something else is called the Passaporta Seminar. And this seminar is a gathering, a gathering of authors, a gathering of authors talking about one specific subject every two years, a different subject every two years, and this year we were talking about the reader. So in a case, the last four, four days we've been talking about you. <laughs> you, the reader, but of course we've always also been talking about ourselves. Because not only readers are readers, also writers are readers. And <clears throat> it's an interesting, endless topic as we will try to show you tonight. We're going to bring some excerpts of our discussions. We're going to bring some excerpts of the texts that the writers have been writing as well. Because this was the first question we asked the writers, please write an essay on the reader. These essays, if you're interested, the English versions of them are already on the internet, on the Passaporta website. And in the upcoming couple of weeks, we will add the original versions as well. So I've been <clears throat> mentioning the writers a couple of times, but who are these people? Um, I've had the honor and the pleasure to spend the last few days with four very intelligent and inspiring authors who are French writer and literary critic for Le Monde, Florence Noiville. After her residency here in Passaporta in 2013, she published a novel that has been translating, translated into English as A Cage in Search of a Bird. And currently she's working on a new novel. We'll be telling you about that a little bit later on. Belgian Congolese writer, Jean Bofan, um, who might be uh, known for his novel Mathematique Congolaise, which has been trans translated into Dutch as Congolese Wiskunde, has been con uh, translated into other languages as well. And his last novel is called Congo Incorporated for which he received the Prix de Saint Continent de la Francophonie. That was last year, if I'm not. No. Two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> then, <clears throat> pro prolific Dutch writer, Kees het Hart, who's received uh, a couple of literary prizes as well during the years. His latest novel, Wederzijds, Mutual, uh, was long listed for the Libris Literature, Literature Prize this year, or last year. And then finally, Dutch-speaking Belgian author Christophe van Gerwey, who was awarded the debut prize for his debut novel, Op de Hoogte. And uh, he recently published his novel, <coughs> Werk, 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 which translates into work, work, work. <laughs> <laughs> so much I've done already. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start the evening with a poem. So I'd like to, to invite Kezethart to the podium. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, <coughs> this poem, I read it for you in Dutch, but the, there will be a translation in English. Uh, I wrote this poem, I think, some 20 years ago, and it is the title poem of my poetry book that was published in I, I'm not sure, 1998, something like that. And uh, the, the, the poetry is called, uh, the book was called, and the poem is called Kinderen die leren lezen. 
and it's it's amazing when I was writing this essay for this seminar uh, I, I just I, I wrote about my own starting of reading and then I remembered this poem and there is there is when, when children I learn to read there is something double in it that's that's my point of view about that there is something double there is you when you learn to read you come into the world and that's glad you can be glad about it it's nice to meet all the books etc etc but also there are some some there is some dark side on it there is something on it that you you will meet the world from the dark side sad story the society is sad you will you you come into the world that's what the poem is about kinderen die leren lezen kinderen die leren lezen zitten in lokalen uit te rusten van onrustige verhalen er hangt een stilte zoals tussen auto's op parkeerterreinen en tussen bomen. En juf beklimt het podium met wit papier. Kinderen die leren lezen hangen letters te drogen aan de wanden van de klas. In de winter steekt juf de kaarsen aan. En kinderen die leren lezen, mogen zingen. En ze beschilderen papier met de lievelingskleuren van hun lievelingsdier. Kinderen die leren lezen, denken aan de slaap van de komende nacht. So for our first conversation, we're joined by Florence Noiville, Kees het Hart. Um, uh, we've been talking about uh, reading in every aspect imaginable. So of course we started with the very beginning. So I have a question for both of you. Um, why don't you take us back to your very beginning, the moment you learned to read? Should I start, really? Wow. <laughs> okay, so uh, it all started like this. I was uh, eight or nine, maybe, and uh, all of a sudden, my mother disappeared. She vanished with no explanation for one month or maybe a little more. And uh, we, the children, didn't understand. My father didn't give, me any exp didn't give us any explanation. The adults around us would say that, uh, okay, she come back, she's traveling. But we as children could sense that there was something abnormal and uh, something wrong going on, but we didn't know what. It was only much later that uh, I discovered that uh, she, was, uh, she had been sent to a psychiatric hospital and, uh, because she was bipolar. Uh, but of course, I was brought up in a very bourgeois French family, uh, quite conservative, I must say, <laughs> and uh, these things were never discussed. So you can imagine, in front of this silence, the uh, number of questions of a child, of an eight-year-old child, which uh, were, why did she disappear? Where is she? Why did our father uh, lie to us? Is our, fa is our mother not reliable? Um, is it my fault? Am I guilty? Is she dead? Well, things like that, but hundreds of things like that. And of course, in this kind of circumstances, what you seek when you are that age uh, is two things. A, reassurance. B, explanations. My father couldn't give us that because he was completely obsessed and focused on the, on the health of uh, his wife. So there were only one possibility, 
one place, one object that, that could give us. Guess what? <laughs> so I started to read. And then again, funnily enough, it was my mother who gave me the very books that made me a book addict. She gave me a um, collection, or a series, what, what's collection. a collection of books <laughs> called Mille Soleil in French. And that was, uh, at that time, that was published by Gallimard. Many various authors like uh, Kessel, Kipling, uh, Bosco, uh, Hemingway, Le Vieil Homme et la Mer, uh, things like that. And I was a lucky child. I was growing up on a, on a big estate with a forest, a river, horses. And it echoed immediately uh, the sense of being alone in the nature, the sense of um, wildlife, the sense of... Uh, and of course, I discovered that the world was tougher than it appeared in those books. That was the major lesson. So I became really convinced that those books were magical objects that had been written for me because they were echoing my very deep uh, feelings. They were bringing me answers and they were just, uh, yes, they were made, they were made for me. They, it was obvious that the writer had understood my problems. It was obvious that he knew who I was and it was obvious that it was talking to me. Wow. And then one day I, t I told my mother, I really love those books and uh, so it's so incredible that they wrote that for me. <laughs> so she said, but you know, uh, they are published by a publishing house, and there are hundreds of thousands of readers who've read them, and they like it too. I said, uh-huh, you're kidding? You're kidding me? <laughs> I know. And then I discovered the bitter truth, and then I was awfully disappointed. Case, <laughs> um, in, in your essay, uh, you're talking about learning to read, discovering books, and you describe it is a very physical act. You even uh, liken it to discovering sex. Mm, yeah, in, so, in some way, yes, yes. Uh, in my essay, I, and I, I, myself, I, I, I'm wondering about the, the, the strange thing that I, I, I am addicted to reading. And I read everything, it doesn't matter what it is, and I try to to explain, and in my essay I try to explain this. What what is it so nice uh, to 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 become a, a addicted reader? And in my essay I try to to connect it. I'm not. It is not science what I'm write, writing. I try to connect it with uh, with learning in sexuality. There there must be a connection between that. Uh, my colleagues this three weeks learned that I'm a Freudian kind of writer and I, I always bother them with with this uh, kind of things but I, I try that to, to realize when you, when you when you read when you learn to read it's such a natural thing to do and every, every uh, and you almost forget that it's it's very artificial learning to read it's something that takes place in society in a family circle and it's not really natural. And you can compare it with, with everybody has a reading career. Uh, so, uh, I am reading uh, awfully much. Other people don't read anything. And uh, uh, you, know, you know what I mean. The same goes up for sexuality. Everybody has a, a, a sexual career. And you can compare it. <laughs> when you're young, you don't know how to act. You don't know these rituals of <coughs> sexuality. And it's comparable with reading rituals. You don't know that. And when you're uh, getting older, you, you get a big repertoire of sexuality, or a small repertoire, or you hate it, or, or, or whatever. And, and so this, there, I think there must be this, this connection, in, in a way. Uh, that's a great comparison. Um, I think that will uh, uh, be discussed afterwards as well. Um, <laughs> uh, you've been talking about um, 
the way in which literature came to you as as kind of new world, uh, a world of which you couldn't um, imagine that it wasn't made for you, just for you. Um, you also named a couple of uh, author names, but was that uh, the reality at the time? Was literature a collection of text written by people, or was it just literature, books, stories? Well, at that time, I was not aware of the author. I was not really aware of the collection. I, used, I just used to read innocently. And um, that's what I like about uh, um, writing for children, for example, uh, which I also do. I started with uh, children's books, thinking that it was uh, easier, because I was shy about writing for adults. I started with children's books. It's not at all easier. It's much more difficult. So that was a huge mistake of mine. And, um, and I, underst I later understood why, because uh, you have to give uh, the children something really uh, gripping immediately from A to Z without uh, losing yourself in descriptions or whatever. So there must be nothing useless. Every, every word must count. It's like an épure or the skeleton of something. And, uh, and uh, we discussed this, uh, we, we said that Singer also says that. Uh, yes. Yes. So should I? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, yeah. in the discussion we have, yeah, in the discussion I we... Can, I can hold screen. Oh, yes. <laughs> in the discussion we had, uh, that reminded me that Singer, who is uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer, the Nobel Prize for Literature, who also wrote for children uh, and had much fun doing so, explained the ten, ten reasons why he liked writing for children. And uh, I'm going to read them uh, in French, unfortunately. Is that why? Yeah, okay. So, il y a 500 raisons pour lesquelles j'ai accepté d'écrire pour les enfants. Mais pour gagner du temps, je ne vais en mentionner que 10. Premièrement, les enfants lisent des livres, pas des critiques. Ils se moquent bien des critiques. Deuxièmement, ils ne lisent pas pour trouver leur identité. Troisièmement, ils ne lisent pas pour se libérer de leur sentiment de culpabilité, ni pour apaiser leurs besoins de révolte, ni pour sortir de leur aliénation. Quatrièmement, ils n'ont que faire de la psychologie. Cinquièmement, ils détestent la sociologie. Sixièmement, ils ne se fait pas de comprendre Kafka ou Finnegan's Wake, ce qui signifie sans doute que la prose de l'écrivain, quel que soit son public, doit être aussi limpide et directe que possible. Septièmement, il croit encore en Dieu, la famille, les anges, les démons, les sorcières, les lutins, la logique, la clarté, la ponctuation et des tas d'autres choses périmées. Huitièmement, ils aiment les histoires intéressantes, pas les commentaires, les index ou les notes en bas de page. Neuvièmement, quand une histoire les ennuie, ils baillent ouvertement, sans honte, ni crainte des autorités. Dixièmement, Ils ne s'attendent pas à ce que leur écrivain bien-aimé sauve l'humanité. Si jeune soit-il, ils savent que ce n'est pas dans son pouvoir. Seuls les adultes peuvent nourrir de telles illusions. So it all starts so innocently. But then, a case, um, if, even in your short biography, you call yourself a reading addict. Yes. Yes, and someone who is maybe even in search of, or in need of help, but you don't want any. No, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a psychosis. Is that the right word? And I don't, I don't want to get rid of it. I, I like it. I want, and I get on read, I, I'm also a professional reader, so I, I write critics, but that doesn't matter. I also read, uh, Bestselling novels and, and from uh, Dan Brown, and I like it. And uh, but, but uh, also, I, I don't have to discuss this in the paper. <laughs> but, but I, I just I just like and, 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 and uh, strip novels. I, I write them out. Donald Duck. I, I like it very much. I still read it. <coughs> I don't want to get 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 rid of it. So, so I like this addiction, you know. And um, uh, um, along those lines, we were discussing. Um, illnesses as a strategy or reading as an illness and then the illness as a, sub, a subject metaphor writing 
and uh, there was a discussion between the two of you, and I would like to um, very shortly to have your yeah. yes, because <laughs> we don't we don't have much time. Um, very shortly to have your both of your opinions, because uh, well, okay, I, I start. Uh, uh, I think there could be a problem. I'm, I'm careful, I try to formulate it carefully. There could be a problem with a novel wherein the, the, the head personage uh, is, uh, has a path pathological illness. Uh, I think, but uh, in the discussions, I, I talked about a Dutch novelist, Herman Koch. He wrote a novel about uh, crime, etc., etc. And in the end, it appeared that it all depended on the, the riddle wasn't tragic, but the riddle was some of these people in the novel was mad, really mad, pathological mad. So I thought, well, that's that, uh, uh, it's a bad novel. That I, I put it now uh, uh, in short. <coughs> and then we had a discussion, and, and, and I will not explain that, but Florence will bring some arguments against it. Against it. <laughs> We argued, uh, Kes and I, about that because I said that uh, starting with my own experience with seeing my mother bipolar, it was quite amazing to try and understand why she could be, you know, like this uh, all, all the time and um, how what such a small thing in her brain, which was probably nothing like a lack of serotonin or something like that, which was in, in fact like a, a broken leg, except that it was uh, much more taboo than a broken leg, uh, could um, have such an influence on her life, but not also on mine, on, on, on my sister's life, etc. So she was ill, I wasn't ill, but then I became, uh, it was like a co contaminating me because my, then from, suddenly from one day to another, it was as if a, a black curtain had fallen down and my vision of the world would never ever be the same. So I was really amazed by that. And I, I, tr I started to become very much interested in, in what's going on in, in, in under this. <laughs> and, uh, and so I started a first novel on uh, maniaco depressive, psychose maniaco depressive. Uh, that was the name at the time. Now it's called bipolar disease. Um, and then I went on with other uh, mental disorders such as uh, uh, obsession through a love story. Then I, I dealt with erotomania through a thriller. And in the very last one, which I almost finished at Passaporta, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm dealing with addictions. So that was the beginning of our fight. Uh, uh, he said, what? Addiction? But I can't see that I, I as a subject. Addiction becomes all, like, I'm a Freudian. It's uh, because I, I lived in, I lived in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a triangle. Father, mother, and there was I. And there must be some in this construction that took me to addiction of reading. I, I have a kind of belief in that. I can't, I can't scientific give arguments, but I can't, there must be an explanation for my addiction. And I think that there's something in this kind of things. And Florence said, no, it's just in the brain. We have a behaviorist on this side. <laughs> and a biologist, a biochemistry on the other side. We won't solve this fight, it goes on and on and on. But what we will do is listen to you, because you are going to read excerpts from a novel which hasn't been published yet. So we're getting a, a, a scoop. Yes! <laughs> so, please, um, we're, uh, your attention for Florence Noivy, who's going to read from the novel Confession d'un Kleptoman. Just a word for the background. I chose an addiction, which in my view was one of the maybe funniest one or the, one of the more Romanesque one. And I chose kleptomania and the uh, protagonist is an old woman, wealthy, uh, very proper, but who turns out to be a terrible kleptomaniac. So I'm trying to convince yeah. you, yes. Case, okay. that yeah. Yeah. addiction can be. Yeah. I know I will. 
<rire> Again, it's in French, so forgive me. <coughs> Sa kleptomanie marchait par cycle. Ses pulsions allaient et venaient. Parfois, elle s'en donnait à cœur joie, portée par l'euphorie, s'enhardissant d'un jour sur l'autre. Mais il arriva aussi qu'elle ne touche plus à rien pendant de longues périodes. Kleptocline. Entre les deux, dans les périodes de basse zoo, elle pouvait aussi piquer distraitement, machinalement presque. Pas seulement des objets de valeur, pas du tout. Comme tous les vrais kleptomanes, ce qui la tentait était souvent dérisoire. Parfois même complètement inutile. Elle n'aurait pas su dire pourquoi, par exemple, il lui fallait à la pharmacie, s'emparer d'une sixième pince à épiler quand elle en avait déjà cinq dans sa trousse de toilette. Une pince, un rouge à lèvres, tout ça tombait si facilement dans un sac à main. Tout était dans le geste, la souplesse du poignet, qu'il fallait comme au violoncelle casser légèrement. Combien d'articles inutiles avait-elle ainsi détourné de leur présentoir Combien de crèmes de jour, de soins pour la nuit, de sérum de la mer, de perles de caviar, d'émulsions d'orchidées Bien sûr, il aurait été impossible de parler de tout ça à son mari. Cet homme était d'une telle honnêteté, scrupuleuse, maladive presque. Et si sa femme, non, non, ses valeurs, sa culture, sa carrière, il en aurait fait une crise cardiaque. Alors là, je, je passe un énorme morceau du, du roman. Elle décide de se soigner. C'est vraiment vers la fin. Elle se procura les coordonnées d'un de ses centres américains, une clinique dans le Michigan, qui ne soignait pas seulement les kleptomanes, mais tous les patients qui s'étaient rendus coupables de vols obsessifs ou compulsifs, ce que les Américains appelaient « addictive compulsive, compulsive stealing »,« overspending »,« shopaholics »,« hoarding », bref, tous ces gens qui entretenaient un rapport pathologique avec l'argent ou les objets, ou peut-être la vie en général. Une publicité disait qu'ils étaient 10% de la population américaine. 10% se demanda à Valentine. Ça lui parut énorme. Des millions et des millions de personnes. La page d'accueil interrogeait. How much would you have to steal to finally feel satisfied or to make life fair? Je passe encore. Elle a rendez-vous avec un médecin. Le neurobiologiste pensait qu'avant toute chose, elle devait comprendre. « Comprendre comment ça marchait là-haut, » dit-il, en faisant un petit geste en direction de sa boîte crânienne sous sa chevelure rousse. « Alors voilà comment ça se passe, » poursuivit le docteur Karoui. « Repartons des origines. Un homme marche dans la forêt et trouve une rivière particulièrement poissonneuse. Un saumon C'est son cerveau de la récompense qui réagit d'abord. Mais comme ce poisson est important pour sa survie, il faut qu'il puisse reproduire l'expérience, qu'il sache où était cette rivière et comment y retourner. C'est pourquoi, vous comprenez, la nature a mis ensemble dans la même région du cerveau la survie et l'habitude. Vous me suivez Valentine fit oui de la tête, car oui poursuivait. À ce stade, l'homme est super attentif à ce qui l'entoure. Mais ensuite, ça devient une habitude, un comportement presque automatique. Vous voyez Comme quand on apprend à conduire. Au début, c'est difficile, et puis on bascule dans l'habitude. « Oui, dit Valentine, mais excusez-moi, je ne vois pas bien le rapport avec la kleptomanie. » Le rapport, eh bien, c'est le cerveau de l'habitude qui prend le relais. Une zone du cerveau nommée putamen. Oui, je sais, putamen, c'est très très moche comme nom. Eh bien, à ce moment-là, voyez-vous, votre putamen prend le pouvoir dans votre cerveau. En gros, ce qu'il ce qui, ce qu vous répète sans cesse, c'est... Refais-le, refais-le, refais-le. Ça peut être la drogue, le flash d'héroïne qui fait qu'on se sent bien, le poker, la musique, le travail, la nourriture bien sûr. La boulimie ou l'anorexie procède de cette même logique. Et bien sûr, le sexe. Strauss-Kahn Comme je vous le disais, c'est votre pute amène qui vous dit « refais-le, refais-le, refais-le ». Même un trauma, un souvenir envahissant peut fonctionner comme ça. Votre putamen vous dit « repense-y, repense-y, repense-y ». La récompense n'est pas forcément une chose positive. Ce qui caractérise ces actions compulsives, c'est qu'on peut les faire et les refaire, même si elles sont négatives pour soi, indépendamment des conséquences. Mais, dit Valentine, elles ne sont pas toujours négatives. « Non, répondit le neurobiologiste, c'est toute l'ambiguïté de l'addiction ». C'est aussi ce qui la rend si intéressante. Si vous êtes accro au violon ou au travail, ce sera valorisé socialement. Tandis que si vous l'êtes à l'alcool ou au sexe, 
Valentine ne savait plus quoi dire. Après un silence, Caroui reprit. « Alors vous voyez, tout ce débat sur le libre-arbitre. Pour les scientifiques, il n'y a rien d'autre là qu'un mécanisme neuronal. Vous avez cette mini-structure pas plus grosse que ça. » Il montra la taille de son pouce. « Et c'est elle qui va prendre le contrôle de votre vie. » Fascinant, non So, um, <coughs> we'll see, no, we'll see Florence back in a little bit, um, and we'll invite Christophe to the stage. <coughs> so, um, we were discussing all aspects of readership of readers, and at a certain point we were discussing uh, the social status of readers as well. And um, before we knew it, we were uh, asking the question, namely, can reading make you a better person? Christophe, what are your thoughts? Well, the, um, it is actually in, in Gacy's text that was published in a newspaper on Friday that uh, he writes literally that he is quite certain that people cannot become better persons or better human beings uh, because of reading. Um, and I, I don't want to believe that. So I, I think that maybe you do not become a better person in a, in a kind of ethical way, but maybe you, you do become smarter and more intelligent. So it, it can be a sort of consequence of much reading that you, in the end, will use this intelligence for bad reasons, maybe to, to commit uh, terrible crimes. But in the end, there is a kind of, uh, yeah, I think a kind of positive effect of, of reading uh, very much. And I think even that what, what we concluded what was that the, the fact that Case is so skeptical about the effects of reading is actually an effect of his reading. Because he has read so much, he has learned to be skeptical. And that, uh, so he sort of proved himself that he was wrong. Of course, Case, you don't agree. No, I don't agree. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, there is this problem, uh, if it is true uh, that reading makes you a better or a smarter or more intelligent uh, man or woman, then I would be unbelievable intelligent and smart. <laughs> and that is not, and empathic, you know? You know the stories from reading, you, you, you get more empathic feelings for the world and your fellow people. But it really is not true. It really is not, I, I don't, I, uh, maybe it's true, but I don't believe in it that I am smarter than a guy in the street who never really read at all, or more intelligent, or more empathic. It, 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 you know, contrary, contrary. It, this guy in the street, a woman, it, it is maybe much more empathic, and and he didn't read at all. So, uh, uh, but there is, I have a solution for this. I, I have a solution for this. I, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you that I want to believe that uh, it's good for the society that I'm a big reader and you are all big readers. It's good for the society. There will be a revolution made by readers. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, but my theory is that uh, uh, reading, I think I will always plea, make, plea for reading, always, in all situations. But the idea is that uh, for me, you, you're not becoming a better uh, person, but you, you, you create better dreams about that. You create, by reading, better dreams about society. And, and, but you, you will not be a revolutionary by, by reading. Not, not at all. Not, that's, that's, that's the solution for you. No. Um, <laughs> we won't we won't solve all the problems tonight we're just going to make these people our accomplices um, 
Uh, one of the more surprising uh, uh, topics for me, because I have a very different experience myself, is that um, uh, some of the writers were talking about the way in which they were changed as a person by reading in uh, a couple of ways that I can understand. Um, reading gives you a certain amount of cultural capital. You're uh, developing a sort of a, a persona. You're a better person in a way because you are well read. Um, but then you came up, you, you, you told us something that I, I really didn't experience. And that was that in your youth, because you were a reader, you had more success with the girls. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, uh, when I was a young boy, uh, 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 and a little bit older, of course, I tried to be friended with girls. And it was, I was not very successful. I started to write poetry that, that had something to do with my reading. You know what I mean. I started to dress up like a poet. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean. 15 years old, the beatnik. Uh, uh, and then I discovered that my reading and, and writing poetry and my opschepperij, uh, what uh, is opschepperij, bread, breading. Breading. Breading about literature and, 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 and talking with a loud voice about literature. It took the attention, it took the attention of girls. There were some girls. And I married, still married with the same girl that I met at school. She was 13 and I was 16. And nowadays sometimes we talk about the old days. And she said, yes, there, there was something in you. I was... I, you, you talk so much about literature, that's was a great thing. So it, it made my, uh, my sexual status higher. <laughs> Is this your experience, Christoph? <laughs> no, I think I, I, I experienced more uh, often the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was born in a different uh, age and in a different country. <laughs> But I must say that maybe it, it's true that there are, that what I have experienced is that maybe a very limited amount of girls or women are attracted by reading, but it is at the same time a kind of necessity. So girls that are not attracted in one way or another by reading, I don't find interesting myself. So, <laughs> so in that sense, uh, I, I agree with you, but it, it was just... I just had a much more lonely life than you were. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one, uh, one writer that we had the privilege of uh, having around us for the last couple of days who has actually written about this. And uh, so I would like to uh, ask Florence, Florence back to the stage and read us an excerpt from her novel Attachment, in which erotic attraction takes place. Between a pupil and, uh, well, a young student and a professor of, uh, of uh, <coughs> literature. So uh, it's uh, the uh, student who um, speaks now. But what made you attractive to me, ravishing, in the sense that you had ravished, conquered, captured, enchanted me? It all started with Le Misanthrope. You had us study that sad comedy in your class. Did you choose it on purpose? Act two, scene one. Write it down, study that passage for the next class. In the next class, you sent me to the front of the room. I can see myself sitting at your light-colored wooden desk. It was only an ordinary piece of furniture, a sort of beechwood box courtesy of the National Education Department. But sitting at your place was impressive. Miss N, are you ready? We're going to read this scene. You are silly men, I'm Alceste. My heart was beating, the curtain lifted, you were at the back of the class, the book in your hand, and you were watching me. Are you ready? The scene was unusual. 
you and I at opposite ends of a, di a diagonal line with 30 questioning faces between us, 30 others who separated and joined us, who were our audience, an impatient audience, curious to see the curtain rise on this strange private encounter. So it begins, Alceste Célimène, and Alceste says how much he loves Célimène, etc. Alceste. Indeed, in all the world, it has no peer. Words can't describe the nature of my passion, and no man ever loved in such a fashion. fashion. There, you said that in your warm, husky, pipe smoker's voice. You lingered a bit on the A in passion, you worked at the silences, <coughs> your effects, curtain. A French literary class, a bit stunned, had just witnessed your declaration firsthand. You, Alceste, you were already quite smitten, and I was no doubt in enough of a state for that theatrical dialogue to assume snippets of truth as we continued. After that, throughout the entire school year, Beyond the feeling of great complicity, nothing happened, but the essential had happened. You told me I love you in the language of Molière, and in our own private theater of love, that would remain the primordial scene, the seal. <laughs> This is an example of uh, an extreme uh, accordance between two readers. Uh, Christoph, um, part of your text deals with, uh, with um, uh, Gustave Flaubert and Georges Sand. Um, and mainly, uh, you, you discuss the fact that uh, Gustave Flaubert wasn't really happy about the way in which his novel, um, Education Sentimentale, was um, uh, written about at the time, or was read at the time. And then Georges Sand um, writes in a letter to Gustave Flaubert, well, maybe this, this novel of yours is just too difficult. Maybe you should have started with uh, a sort of disclaimer, a disclaimer in which you state um, what kind of novel it is and how it should be read. Um, maybe you, should, you could pick it up from there. Yeah. So they, indeed, they talk a lot about this problem. Flaubert is, is quite unhappy uh, also with the fact that he thinks that the, the, so Flaubert is a bit very, is a great writer also because he expressed all, I think, all the troubles that writers can have in a, in a very eloquent and also neurotic way. Um, and so he is a bit depressed, really, because he, he thinks that all the reviews of his of L'Education Sentimentale have been uh, rubbish, and also the book sells very bad. And he even goes as far as, so we're in uh, Paris in uh, 1871, right after the, the revolution of the Communards. And Flaubert even goes so far as to say that if the, the French and the Parisians had really read and understood his book, then all these terrible things would not have happened. <laughs> so he, I think it's a position of a writer who really asks, you could say, something impossible of his reader. And that is, uh, I think, a, a sort of more general question about what you can expect as an author uh, from your readers. Is there a possibility of overestimating the readers, or should you always be more careful not to not to underestimate uh, readers? Um, we're being called by Gustave. No, by reader. <laughs> no, by reader <yeah. coughs> well, this is this is Gustave Flaubert complaining. <coughs> um, what is your own? What are your own thoughts on that? Um, are you the kind of writer? who is easy, easily um, discouraged by um, the way in which people receive your novels or maybe the way in which people talk about your novels or writing about your novels? Or do you give them some credit? And do you, are you one of those writers who think that um, once the novel has been published, 
it leads its own life and you as an author may be more or less dead. Yeah, I think that that's certainly true, but I, I think that's something sometimes always uh, a hard thing to experience. So um, uh, I, I try not to underestimate uh, readers, um, but at the same time, it's it's always yeah, difficult, like in the case of Flaubert, to to really uh, to have a kind of. You can imagine that for, for a lot of readers and maybe or, or writers and maybe I'm one of them, uh, it's never enough. There's always a kind of uh, extra reaction that you would have hoped for or uh, a more profound analysis of one of your books. Do you do you need your readership and do you need your readership to be of a certain quality or maybe of a certain size? Yeah, that's another difficulty. I mean, in a way, it's consoling that we see that or that there are documents from which we see that even someone like Flaubert, who is probably the most uh, important writer certainly in France from the 19th century, that even someone like Flaubert had the impression during his life that he didn't have enough uh, readers. Um, so... Out of control. <laughs> so, Something has happened. Yeah, who knows? Just answer maybe the telephone. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's difficult in a way. I think you can uh, you can never have enough readers, but there's also also the necessity to just have kind of trust that books will find the, the readers um, they need. Um, at, at the same time. I guess that we both agree that um, there is a, a lot to be desired when we're talking about the way people, why is this telephone ringing all the time? <laughs> um, there's a lot to be desired when we're talking about the way in which we in, in the public sphere um, talk about literature nowadays and um, the way in which um, literature as a whole and, and, and your books uh, in particular um, uh, are received. Are we in a sort of crisis of readership or crisis of reading? Well, I, I sometimes have the impression that, that books or, and some books can get a kind of tag or a few words that are attached to these books and then you get this kind of almost uh, mass hysteria uh, concerning these books and also the, 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 the same cliches get talked about or get rehearsed uh, in reaction to these books uh, over and over again. So I do think it, it, it's good to have uh, different perspectives uh, on, on, on a book and that also, uh, yeah, that there are, there's, the, the different views or let's say reader reports, different kinds of reader reports are circulating and are available to the to the public and that's maybe also one of the reasons that I and other writers that were part of the program this week too uh, also write reviews. Um, <clears throat> you could also say that um, the fact that we do not always know how to talk about books is also a product of a kind of aesthetic that is a modernist aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're talking about the, the way in which we, the, the modern, modern literature is um, going about, is trying to uh, submerge us in a story that is not clear from the beginning. Yeah. Um, are we maybe at the point that we must conclude that modernity has lived its life? Yeah, or you, maybe you can say that this kind of uh, aesthetic experience in which you enjoy being confronted with what is <coughs> strange and frightening maybe, that maybe this, this kind of experience is, has, has uh, uh, migrated elsewhere and that, what, that it's no longer the reasons people read, the, mm -hmm. the main reason why they read is to, be, to, be to, to have something comfortable and to have something 
that is that is not surprising maybe because the I don't know the uh, in fact the president of America is surprising as it is so <laughs> we, maybe we would uh, books we, we need a kind of norm, norm more normal uh, world inside of books and not something that is uh, confronting but at the same time I think that that still it's, it's good to always or to to expect also from a reader this this kind of um, preparedness to be surprised uh, and not not simply to go looking inside of a book things that you already know but really things that are different and that you don't understand immediately okay thank you um i would like to invite uh, jean on the stage um, <coughs> Jean, um, just now we were talking about um, some kind of <coughs> crisis, maybe a crisis of reading, crisis of readership. Um, we don't read as much as we used to. Um, during our discussions, um, we enjoyed listening to you uh, greatly, um, but we were astonished as well because um, we were time and again confronted with the fact that we in the West have luxury pro problems. If we are talking about a crisis of reading, then we're not taking into account vast um, pieces of the world, vast areas in the world where having books is just not as common as it is here. Uh, you were talking about Congo and uh, the role books play over there. If you hear this term, a crisis of reading and crisis of readership. What is your reaction to that? I mean, I mean I'm, uh, I'm surprised and upset, you know, and upset. Because, uh, like you say, the, the, it's a luxury uh, problem here. We have a problem in that, 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 uh, the, in this, uh, that uh, topic. You know, you must know that uh, we, I mean, what, what is this political reason first? You know, there's, um, there's a political, there is political reason. What we know in Congo, we had uh, the, col the colonization. Colonization, 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 you must know that, you know, because we had, we had Belgium. They talked to you about colonization, you know, colonization it was maybe something good. Okay, don't discuss about that, but what, what about reading, about uh, uh, knowledge? In 1960, in the independence, there were exactly 26 Congolese uh, in the university, 26. 10 were out of the university in 1960. That means 16 were still in the university. There were 629 from the technical higher, uh, technique superior. That's all for a country. That's political reason. After the independence, we have, the, we have a dictatorship. We have a dictatorship. I was a publisher in Kinshasa. I made my, my publishing company in 1990. 1990, that means Mobutu decided, okay, we're gonna put a, make a little, uh, a little uh, democratization. So, and then in 90, uh, we start. 91, I came in Brussels to buy a machine to print. So you can, you can imagine, so for us, uh, a book, a book is something huge. It's something huge, a, a book like a Mathematic Congolese, Congolese Whiskey. My book cost around 60 and 70 dollars. That means 50 euro. So that's the, that's the, that's what you know about, we know about, uh, about books. And, um, books are very, very difficult to, to, to find. So that, and, and what happened? People are in love with books. If I made this book, Mathematic Congolese, with one guy who was working all day with one book under his shoulder, it's because I saw it. If I made a publishing company in Congo, that means <laughs> I saw there was a need and I was selling, uh, I was selling thousands of, of uh, things every, every week, every week. I was counting by week, not like Gallimard here. I make my account every year. No, 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 <laughs> every week. It was, it, was, it was cheap things, but I mean, I was selling. People wanted to read, people wanted to have a paper in front of them. And, um, and uh, what well, does the, the it's, for us, books is something huge. And, and what, uh, what there is inside? You must know we can combo what we say. We say that white, white men steal with a pen. 
because he came in Congo, they make somebody sign the paper. And the Congo was the, was was dead Congo, dead country. <laughs> you understand? We just we were just a paper. Well, uh, Congo is uh, is still Leopold two, Leopold the second. I wonder to who he paid that who, to who he paid that Congo uh, because we never we, we I would like to to share the money with you. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> he, he escaped with the money. We never saw the money. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, and, and uh, that's that's the the difference. So. Uh, Mathematic Congolese is based on a, on a book. And I want to, to tell you, to, to, to read you the, the, the down of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of a lecture in, in, the, in, the, in the case of my, my character. He was, a, he was in love with one book. We can, we, in Congo, we can, we can build our life with one book because there's not more than one book. I'm going to read it in French. If you. Comme le cosmos, l'engouement de Célio pour les mathématiques avait une origine. Il devait avoir dans les dix ans quand il avait rencontré un livre. Un bouquin pas mal abîmé, orné d'une couverture vert olive intitulée Abrégé de mathématiques à l'usage du second cycle, concocté par un certain Kabea Moutombo. Édition 67. L'ouvrage était le seul bien qui lui restait de feu son père. Cyprien Matémona et Célio l'avaient conservé précieusement comme une relique. Le livre était plus que fatigué. Pour parvenir jusqu'à cette époque, il avait dû subir plusieurs restaurations, mais pour rien au monde, le jeune homme n'aurait pu s'en séparer. Tout petit, il avait trouvé plutôt rébarbatif. Tous ces triangles parcourus de traits et de pointillés qui allaient dans tous les sens ne réussissaient qu'à l'égarer dans ses tentatives de comprendre quoi que ce soit. Des angles qui avaient la faculté de chauffer jusqu'à 180 degrés sans qu'on sache trop pourquoi, le laissaient plutôt sceptique. Que dire de ces caractères qui se montaient les uns sur les autres, qui s'additionnaient ou, ou, ou se multipliaient avec des signes qui n'existaient dans aucun alpha alphabet normal En dehors de sa valeur sentimentale, le volume n'avait aucun intérêt. C'est lieu le conservant dans cet état d'esprit pendant 2-3 ans, jusqu'au jour où en l'ouvrant par hasard, il avait lu... Tout corps plongé dans un liquide subit une pression de bas en haut égale au poids du volume du liquide déplacé. La phrase l'avait frappé comme une révélation. Elle était d'une telle évidence. Les mots avaient résonné en lui comme des paroles divines. Il avait survolé les pages pour en savoir davantage et ce fut l'illumination. Lui qui n'avait plus de parents et personne d'assez intime pour lui servir de guide à travers la vie commença à bâtir ses convictions à partir de ce qui était écrit dans le, dans le, dans le manuel. En grandissant, sa confiance en le livre s'était renforcée. Lors de moments d'adversité, prendre connaissance dans la seconde partie consacrée aux éléments de géométrie que l'on ne peut tirer au point de contingence aucune ligne droite qui passe entre la circonférence et la tangente, mais que par ce point, on peut faire passer une infinité de lignes circulaires avait mis du baume au cœur du jeune homme et lui avait ouvert de nouvelles perspectives. Parfois même, lorsqu'il avait fallu jouer ses semblables, il, avait, il lui avait été utile de savoir que deux pyramides qu'elle soit droite ou oblique, était identique si les bases étaient les mêmes. L'apparence ne comptait pas, il fallait savoir mesurer ce qu'il avait à l'intérieur, comme chez les êtres humains. Le bouquin comportait des vérités inébranlables dont Célio tira une grande partie de la philosophie de sa vie. Le livre devint comme un grimoire capable de lui ouvrir les portes de, de, de monde fabuleux. Tout y était. Il suffisait de lire entre les lignes. Ses connaissances suscitèrent en lui une soif incommensurable de savoir. À travers l'ouvrage, il, il crut vivre une sorte d'initiation. Tout naturellement, il voulut apprendre davantage sous ses fous géniaux à l'origine des théories dont il se délectait. Il tenta de comprendre la vision de personnages tels que Thalès de Millet, qui était convaincu que l'eau était l'élément premier de la cosmogonie. Il voulut saisir les délires d'Albrecht Dürer, qui allia les mathématiques à la peinture et développa des constructions géométriques telles que la spirale d'Archimède ou la spirale logarithmique. De tout cœur, il aspira à faire corps à la démarche de René Descartes qui plaçait la pensée au-dessus de tout et ne se servait des mathématiques que pour éprouver sa réflexion. S'identifier à Max Planck qui mit en lumière la notion de Quanta, un monde étrange dont lui-même dédoutait de la cohérence, était essentiel pour ses lieux. Posséder ce bagage, ce bagage pensait-il, c'était comme avoir l'univers à portée de l'index avec en prime les possibilités infinies que cette situation pourrait procurer.
that's very beautiful. Um, I'm tempted to ask you the same same question that I've uh, asked uh, two of the other writers as well. From your perspective, if you having having heard uh, what impact even a book of mathematics can have on a boy in Congo, from your perspective, can reading make you to a better person? I was arguing before with Florence. <laughs> <laughs> I was arguing with Florence because she said, uh, somebody you want to kill somebody, you want to kill another one, he's going to do it, even if you have read, you have read or, or no. I say yes. But I say that, uh, but I say yes, maybe, but maybe not. But I think it depends what kind of uh, books he, he had read. He had read, because I mean, because I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, I know that book can build, can build you. It it uh, it builds you. This guy here, said you, what, what I'm doing, what I wanted to do is to make the the the. I wanted to to find the tie the, the tie between the literature and mathematics. I found it because because uh, my, my my spirit is, is the is the is the, is the reading that made me my 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 my, my spirit my spirit more 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 far more far until I can get the, I can reach the mathematic and and then when you have read a lot when you know a lot of I mean your education I had a friend of mine who was always telling me you always your education always. Uh, va te rattraper, te rattrapera toujours. And I think when you have read a lot, maybe if you if you want to kill somebody, maybe you're not going to do it because you read this book and this book and this book and this book and this book. Hitler was reading a lot, Stalin too. Yeah, it depends what Mobutu too. Mobutu was reading Machiavel. <laughs> 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 the book of Mobutu when he was sleeping was Machiavelli. So it depends what you read. But I think that the books uh, can save us. I know war. You know, I'm from Congo. I know war. I know people. I know people. I know what, how the way they behave uh, when they are confront with something with extreme violence and when they can do what they want. And I saw so much. I mean, I saw a lot of massacre. I heard about massacre, a lot of massacre, but I heard beautiful stories too during killings. <laughs> well, thank you to, uh, to keep it short because uh, time flies when you're discussing uh, interesting topics. So I would like to ask you to leave the stage for a moment, but you're coming back later. And I would like to invite Florence back on stage. Because um, actually uh, four of the, uh, the participants to, uh, of our, uh, in our conversations, including myself, um, we were actually not only writers but critics as well and we wanted to address um, this double role as well tonight. So Florence and Christophe, um, I would like to discuss this, uh, this topic of reading as a professional critic and I would like to start off with the simplest of all questions. Um, what books do you review? That's easy. I uh, only review um, foreign literature for Le Monde. And um, is that a strategy? A strategy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for two reasons. Um, the first reason is um, it's what I like best. I've always been attracted by Les Ailleurs. Um, there's a line by saint jean Berth which I love, which is uh, Partir, parole de vivant. Very beautiful. So I like, j'aime partir, j'aime revenir. I like languages, I like discovering other cultures, other people, the obvious things. And uh, the, the, the second reason is um, um, it's very comfortable, non pas confortable, enfin, it's very, yes. Uh, because when I have dinner in Paris with other writers, they are usually French. And uh, and they say, oh, you know what? My next book is coming out, etc. <laughs> <laughs> I say, fantastic! <laughs> Please send it to so and so <laughs> because I only do foreign literature. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Christoph, uh, you're a Flemish writer, writing about Flemish 
authors and you are not known for your mildness. So how, how do you navigate that? Yeah, well, I, I don't uh, exclusively write about uh, Flemish authors. I also wrote about last week uh, Julian Barnes, for example. But I, well, I have this rule with myself that I, I you could say that I review a bit like a fireman. That, that when, uh, when a, a book is on fire and I think it shouldn't be on fire, then I just go and put out the fire. <laughs> the opposite is also true when a book is like this small kitten in, in, uh, in a tree and nobody notices it and it's, it goes neglected. And I also think it should be reviewed. So I try to, and this is not always true of course, but I try to uh, review either books that don't get reviewed yet or, or I try to write reviews that of a book that doesn't exist yet, the kind of review. I mean. So if, if, for example, if a book has like 20 extremely positive reviews, I get sometimes the urge to write the one negative review, <laughs> even if it's a good book. <laughs> um, well, an, an interesting question, I think, is uh, I, I myself sometimes experience a, a difference is um, do you read differently when you are uh, writing a review um, compared to when you're reading for a novel or just for pleasure? Um, I've heard people say, and colleagues say that uh, <clears throat> when they read for uh, work uh, they are very analytical and maybe they miss some kind of pleasure. Well. I tend to think that for me it's the opposite. I, when I, I try to go um, deeper and deeper in the book and make notes and underline and write crosses in the margins and uh, all this, my, my books are terribly damaged <laughs> after <laughs> um, I've read them. But um, then it creates a, a really uh, tight uh, relationship with the book. So tight that uh, even if I take them years after, uh, and I see those crosses and those, I, I remember the whole context. It all uh, brings up uh, an atmosphere, a place, a feeling. It's um, it's really strange. It's it really makes me. It creates um, almost a physical link. Uh, has reviewing changed you as a reader? I think so. I sometimes miss this. Uh, the kind of reviewing or the kind of reading I did as a teenager when the possibility of reviewing uh, didn't exist yet. But it, I think it also has a positive uh, consequences. Like Laurent said, I think the relationship with the book that you have reviewed becomes much more intense, just like it's always the case when you have written about something, the bond with this event or with this uh, whatever becomes uh, larger, so it has advantages and disadvantages. Um, I myself have lost um, the ability to really be swept away by a novel uh, years and years and years ago, uh, and that happened during my uh, university studies. Um, I, I consider that a loss. Uh, am I alone in this, or are you victims as well? I'm not sure. I think I still... Uh, really enjoy and I'm swept away by novels. It's just, I just think that I read also like maybe like everybody else, I just read less than, uh, than I used to as a teenager. So the, uh, yeah, for several reasons, I guess. So also the chance of being really swept away is, is simply smaller because I don't read as much as I would like to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Florence, just to finish off this uh, portion, have you ever been uh, so enthusiastic about a novel that you hardly couldn't write about it? Uh, um, yes, I was swept away last week. <laughs> uh, in fact, um, it's, it's strange, something strange to admit, but I had never been, um, I had never really read a, um, a novel by uh, Jens Christian Grondal. And uh, last week, uh, the um, Le Monde sent me to Copenhagen, so I had read a few um, uh, books, uh, including the last novel, of course, and I met him. And um, I was, uh, it, it's, it seemed to me that this small novel, because it's not more than 140 pages, 
was so full of uh, eloquent silences mm. and so full of uh, very fine and, and subtle uh, um, uh, psychology and so full of everything that um, I was hoping that I could reflect that on the page. And when I looked at my poor review, it seemed very pale in comparison to what I had experienced deep down. But I tried my best. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, thank you both for this, uh, this conversation. Um, Jean, I would very much like to invite you to the podium um, in order to read the last paragraph of your uh, essay which is, I'm going to place the microphone here, um, which, uh, well, was very surprising to me. Um, we were talking about uh, the, the, the reader. We talk about the reader, we talk about us, we talk about the reader, we, that, you. But, um, well, I, but but I, not, I noticed that uh, there is another reader that uh, is always with me. Since I'm right, I started to write, is uh, the shadow reader or the the ghost reader, the lector phantom. It's an invisible uh, uh, reader who's always <coughs> beside me, and he talk to me, give me advice. He, I'm going to describe you the way this guy is is working. Très vite, j'ai découvert le lecteur fantôme. Il est apparu de façon inattendue dès la rédaction des premières lignes de mon premier roman. Je m'attendais à tout sauf à la présence d'une ombre occupant la chaise à ma droite. Un ami m'avait prêté son château situé dans la forêt du Luxembourg en Belgique. Les planchers et les marqueteries craquaient sans arrêt et les portraits des ancêtres me fixaient dans la pénombre. J'étais totalement seul, avais-je pensé, et c'est à ce moment-là qu'il est apparu. Immobile la plupart du temps, il ne me parlait jamais, m'obligeant juste à essayer de deviner sa pensée. À son air un peu emprunté, je sentais qu'il ne recherchait pas ma sympathie, mais je le pressentais, mais je le, mais, mais je le pressentais indispensable quelque part dans l'édification de mon œuvre future. C'est avec lui que je discutais des problématiques que j'abordais. Lui et moi, nous nous livrions à des joutes cérébrales des nuits entières. Parfois, pour tenter de le désorienter, je n'écrivais pas tout, le laissant deviner le, le fond de ma pensée. Il était brillant, restait muet, mais ses réflexions à lui apparaissaient toujours lors, lors, des, dans, lors des rencontres dans la bouffe d'un lecteur ou d'un critique littéraire plus performant que les autres. Le, fact, le, le lecteur fantôme est une, enti, une, est une entité cynique aussi. Un mot pouvait me fuir pendant des mois et durant ce laps de temps, je sentais qu'il se moquait de moi. Et pour accentuer ma frustration face à ma propre carence, finalement, il me soufflait le mot en ricanant. C'était d'ailleurs le seul son qu'il émettait, des ricanements. Son attachement pour moi aurait pu me faire croire à un amour inconditionnel pour ma personne, comme les lecteurs en chair et en os déversent sur moi, mais lui, ses motivations envers moi étaient peu claires. Ne sachant pas ce qu'il me voulait, je ne me dévoilais jamais complètement et ne pouvais surtout pas m'octroyer le luxe de l'angoisse de la page blanche il ne fallait surtout pas faire transparaître mes faiblesses. Je me méfiais de lui et pour tout avouer, je ne parvenais toujours pas à l'aimer comme je devrais peut-être le faire. De toute façon, je ne pourrais jamais m'en débarrasser. Une amie devinerait s'est passée me voir l'autre jour, m'a dit qu'elle voyait bien quelque chose de flou autour de moi, mais elle me dit aussi qu'il n'y avait aucune raison que je m'inquiète de sa présence. Le type avait l'air de, de me ressembler comme deux gouttes d'eau, prétendait-elle, mais j'en doutais fortement. La littérature m'avait produit moi et inconsciemment, je savais qu'elle ne pouvait produire ce genre de fantôme. Même Shakespeare, créant le spectre du père d'Hamlet, aurait hésité à en faire un qui ressemble à mon lecteur fantôme. Quoi. So, um, when you're preparing a, a seminar like this, uh, there are a lot of things that you can um, think of yourself. Maybe even um, prepare for, but this I couldn't prepare for. I never thought that we would have a writer who uh, didn't, all, didn't only have a voice inside his head, but also had the feeling that there was a presence outside himself, sitting beside him, when writing. 
But we, don't, we didn't have, only have one writer who experienced this. But then there was Case, who immediately recognized the phenomenon and even knew who his phantom reader was. Yours, I believe, is called Basile. What is yours called? <laughs> it's Francis of Assisi. <laughs> He's comparable with this. I was really amazed what John Jean was telling. It was it was for me natural, but I have this this reader in my mind. Uh, in my debut novel, he is there, and in my poetry, he is there, and and. It's, it's, I'm not Roman Catholic, I'm, uh, uh, I will not be, but uh, uh, Francis of Assisi reads with me and he tells to me, Case, what's you writing now? This is really stupid. Mm -hmm. You are not loyal to me. You must be loyal to me. And it's not about this Roman Catholic Francis that I am referring to, the, the guy who wants us to be and uh, live an ascetic life and never have sex and be poor. It, that's not the way, but it's the uh, other kinds of, uh, there, there are some thing in, things in his life <coughs> that are really great for some, someone who try to write a novel. He, his, yeah, this what is uh, uh, it? He, 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 ever, he ever changed of mind. And there are, are uh, talking to birds is a metaphor of art. I'm not writing for you, I'm writing for the birds. And Francis, Francis did explain me to that. Uh, there are really crazy stories as, about his life uh, that when he, he, when he and his brothers made camp uh, near Perugia and they lived there for 14 days and then one of his brothers said, oh well, we, we, we are here in a nice place, it's nice here. Immediately friends said, okay, we change. Tomorrow we leave here. But because it's not uh, that you must be uh, feeling well at one place, you must ever change, you must ever change. And that's, that's for me, that's talking about literature. Francis learns me to talk about literature. And so, so Jean, he, he has his Francis. Maybe it's my mother dressed up like Francis. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But he's this. Jean had about a <coughs> concrete thing. It's for me concrete. Jean, does it mean uh, that when Basile um, is it fr isn't frowning upon you anymore, then the text is publishable? I think I will never uh, write a text that is not public. It can be published because Basil is there. You know, when, when everybody, when, when they, 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 uh, before even I am writing, they was talking to me about the l'angoisse de la page blanche. You know, the white. I don't know. They said it in French or in English. The fear of the black page. Well, the, the, the fear of black page. I never heard that. Not one second. Not one second. Because of because this guy when is there when I sit down in front of my, of my paper. But when I know that I, I have no idea, I don't sit on the, on the table. I stay far away from the table. You know, so when I sit down, that means I have something. Because Francis maybe is good. This my my guy is not is not nice. I, I don't. <laughs> it, it's, it's not nice. He, he don't speak. He tell me everything. He tell me everything. He he defy me. He, he, it's always. He, well, he always pushed me to go far. So how can I uh, publish? I, I can't. I mean, it must be published. Before even my book is out, I know how many literary press I'm going to have. <laughs> all, all, of that, all of that, because he pushed me, depend the way he pushed me. Yeah, I know I'm going to have one because he pushed me that way. See, he pushed me a lot, I know I'm going to have three, four. If I, that's, that's, he, <coughs> but he put me in problem. I mean, I don't like to write. Francais, she, she had the same thing, and she don't like to, to write, but maybe we don't have the same reason. The reason is that, uh, <coughs> that pressure. Pressure, uh, pression? Pressure. Pressure. You know, it's pressure. Uh, it's for me, it's pressure. It helped me, but it's, it's more pressure than help. <laughs> <laughs> Francis says to me, you must be more radical. 
his stupid bourgeois stories. Stop with that. Be radical about it. You must hunger yourself. Uh. By back to suit, my, my director, editorial director, he loves me a lot. Why? He said because this guy, he, he said everything. You know, you can read books from Africa, coming from Africa, you know? Most, all, all of them. All of them, they, they, they change the name of the country. They invite a name. Uh, you know, they call it the Gondwana, the blah, 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 something, uh, something look like African. I'm the only one in the African literature called Congo Congo. Because of that guy, to be more radical. He said, I, I couldn't, I, I was thinking, do I write Congo? He said, you write Congo, you don't write. That's all. <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is maybe the most extreme reader I have ever heard of. Um, that means that all of you have stiff competition. But that doesn't mean that you uh, shouldn't have a voice. So, if there are questions in the room, this is the moment to ask them. Anyone? No? Everything was clear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they don't dare, they don't dare to question We send them back here. <laughs> 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 this, might be, this might be the most perfect <laughs> Conclusion of the evening, we will send them Basil and Francis. <laughs> yes. Readers, be warned. And readers, um, I thank you very much for being here, for attending this evening. Um, a big thank you to uh, Jean Beaufan, Gezet Hart, Florence Noiville, Christophe van Gerwey. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Passaporta as well for <coughs> the, uh, uh, organizing this seminar. I would like to mention Jack McMartin, who was present uh, with, at, our, at our table. He was our re reporter, and his reports will be published on the website of Passaporta within a couple of weeks. And uh, finally, I would like to mention Maxime Dolola as well. He's the intern here at Passaporta, and he helped us a great deal. Um, thank you all, thank you Passaporta, and I hope to see you in two years' time for the next seminar, um, and in between that, we would like to see you next year at the Passaporta Festival, where you might be able to see some, of, some effects of this seminar, because we are going to try and um, put the spotlight on you. There, should, there shall be more reader in the next festival. Thank you very much, and until next time.